Tonight, delays in the case against a St. John's man accused of killing his wife. A court has yet to hear from Ibrahim Alamad why a judge is granting the man more time to prepare. We're not even here about the price. The price to take care of itself. Uh, well, we just need free enterprise. We need to be able to catch what we're allowed to catch. Crab harvesters in the province are pushing back and facing off against the fisheries minister. It's been 15 years since the Cougar 491 crash. Today, families are remembering their loved ones here at Kitty Vitty Lake. It's hard to believe that it's uh, 15 years gone by. Sometimes it feels like 30 years. Sometimes it feels like 15 days. So. I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. We begin tonight with a heated confrontation outside Confederation Building in St. John's. And the Premier says it's up to the FFAW and the ASP to work this out. He's missing the point. Crab harvesters were facing off against government officials, including the fisheries minister today. About 200 harvesters protested on the steps of Confederation Building this morning. They say they need more buyers for their catch and more competition among processors in order to stay afloat. Reporter Patrick Butler was there. So, Patrick, what are harvesters looking for from the provincial government? So the harvesters are worried about corporate concentration in the processing industry and what that means for their independent businesses. Many harvesters told me they only have one buyer for their crab and, and that means the processors can essentially dictate when they go out, how much they unload at, at, at the wharf um, and how much they're paid. And they want the province to scrap a long-standing ban on buyers from outside the province purchasing fish from Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, they say more buyers means more competition and therefore a better price for harvesters. And they're also looking for more plants and more production capacity at current plants. Now the government said it's evaluating its options, uh, but that it's important to weigh decisions against the impact they might have on processing jobs. Here's a little bit of what we heard and saw outside Confederation Building today. The, the, the real challenge is trying to strike a balance in, in, in the fishery, and that's what we're trying to do in terms of, a, of an outside, bottle, uh, outside buyers coming in. We, Works for the companies, that's what you're for. Yeah. As long as it's for the companies, that's what you're for. Anyway, we're going to do everything we possibly can to find a balance that's good for everybody in the fishing industry. Anyways, thank you for your time. We don't want to make a fortune. We want to make a living. Right. Like the plant worker. All right, listen. Yes, right. man. But, but it starts with us. If, if we don't go fishing, guess what? No one makes a cent today. No, totally. Right? Absolutely. So are, are we important or are we not? But listen, uh, I, I, I can say it all I want, but uh, no one's believing that it is important. And I am from rural Newfoundland and Labrador, I and I ain't going anywhere. I'm a proud Newfoundland and Labrador. I understand it. Uh, 100%. Yeah. No, I'm not ashamed of myself. It'll be not. After, after October, you have a recommendation from the licensing. Yeah, well, I, I understand that. Licenses. And you, you're you sitting on that. Huh? You're now two weeks before the season, you still don't have any season. How are those plants supposed to be ready? Hmm? Well, like, well, who are you protecting? These six big processors? Is there, is there a like grand out of the state's hundreds of people here? Well, some of those harvesters were also expelled from the public gallery of the House of Assembly today during question period. They say they weren't satisfied with what they heard from government and they're planning more protests for the coming days. Well, now to news from the courts. The case against a St. John's man accused of murdering his wife has been postponed for two weeks while he remains under hosp in hospital under supervision. The provincial court judge, Harold Porter, agreed this afternoon to set the next court date for Ibrahim Alamad to March 27th. The court was told Alamad remains hospitalized and needs more time to consider his legal options. The 36-year-old, originally from Syria, is accused of kidnapping kidnapping and murdering his wife on March 5th. Her body was found inside this abandoned house in Outer Cove. Alamad has now appeared by telephone before the court on three occasions since his arrest five days ago and has yet to make any comment. He remains in custody while in hospital where he's under constant guard. 
In other news, the city of Mount Pearl and crews from St. John's teamed up to fight a fire at Central Dairies. It happened late last night in Donovan's Industrial Park. Crews worked for about five hours to extinguish the fire, which was contained to a building used for storage. The company says no employees were injured and production in the main facility is on hold for now. Snow from the weekend storm also posed a challenge, so the city brought in a front end loader to to help firefighters better access the building. Police are working to determine the cause of the fire. Well, Premier Andrew Fury is asking Ottawa to hold off on its plan to increase the carbon tax next month. In a letter to the Prime Minister today, Andrew Fury says the province is receiving a record number of applications from residents looking to switch from oil to electric heating. He says more than 2,100 rebate applications have been submitted. The Premier argues that shows the province has a strong interest in decarbonization. Still, Fury says affordability and the rising cost of living are major issues. He writes in that he writes in that letter, I respectfully request that you consider pausing the implementation for the April 1st carbon tax increase, at least until inflation stabilizes, interest rates lower and related economic pressures on the cost of living sufficiently cool. Well, it was certainly a windy and rainy night last night. Take a look at some of the numbers, uh, rainfall numbers anyway. St. John's recorded 31.6 millimeters of rain. Mount Pearl recorded 66 millimeters of rain. Uh, so we certainly saw some pooling of water on the roads today. But the other story was uh, finally the sunshine came out this afternoon and we had a beautiful shot of the Narrows there. Three degrees in St. John's today. Those winds have eased. Uh, we're down to about nine kilometers per hour. But uh, uh, definitely through areas of central, the west coast woke up to very, very wet snow uh, on the road. Slushy mess, uh, really, that was what it was described as through uh, on uh, social media today. And the reason for that is this area of low pressure spinning all of that moisture over, uh, really at this point, it's in the Green Bay, White Bay area and towards the west coast of the province. We've got some more rain uh, and some snow on the way for parts of the province, but that winter, or sorry, the snowfall warning still in place, and we've got some freezing drizzle advisories in place for the coast of Labrador. I'll break the full forecast down for you coming up. The union representing thousands of home care workers in the province says it's not making much progress at the bargaining table. The collective agreement between home care agencies and NAEP expires in a few weeks, and the union says it's still looking for serious change. Here now is Jessica Singer has that story. Home care is a wonderful thing. It lets people age in Home care workers in the province basic. barely make more than a dollar above minimum wage. Home That's according to NAEP president no Jerry Earle. We keep hearing government talk about and employers talking about uh, being competitive in Atlantic Canada. Well, I can tell you a home care worker in port of could get on the ferry and go for his North Sydney and our wages will increase by over $4 an hour just by crossing on that ferry. So why are Newfoundlanders and Labradorians less valued? The union is at the bargaining table with home care agencies across the province. Its collective agreement expires at the end of the month, and Earl says there's been no progress when it comes to things like compensation. So the union's applied for conciliation. Earl says he's surprised that agencies haven't reached out to government yet, which bears a lot of responsibility over how much employees are compensated. Uh, well, I caution them. They'd better soon go because we're going to find ourselves in a pretty significant situation uh, once we get into conciliation because we're not sitting at this table just spinning our wheels. Uh, we will do what's necessary to attain a contract that respects home care workers and respects the people that they rely upon this service. But the province's Home Care Association says numerous advancements have been made and that it's now up to the government to step in to address wage rates. There's not much of a disconnect in terms of we all we both recognize that the rates for the home care workers, home support workers throughout the province have increased. But the major player that has to be brought into all this is the government. And that's where why we've gone to conciliation at the moment that will help speed the process along and uh, benefit all everyone. 
home care is a one Another sticking point for it's NAEP is that home care home workers home didn't receive a penny from the nearly $8 million given to the sector back in October. The association says that money was given to agencies because they are underfunded. Meanwhile, the union says it's prepared to pull out all the stops to ensure undervalued frontline workers are properly compensated. Jessica Singer, CBC News, St. John's. Well, today marks 15 years since Cougar helicopter flight 491 crashed off the coast of Newfoundland. The tragedy claimed the lives of 17 people on board and prompted an inquiry into offshore safety. As here in now, Heather Gillis reports, safety is still a focus for families all these years later. 15 years on, March 12th remains a somber day for family and friends of those killed in the Cougar 491 crash. Some gathered here at the offshore helicopter memorial in St. John's to pay tribute. Danny Breen's brother Peter was among those killed in the crash. It's hard to believe that uh, 15 years gone by. Sometimes it feels like 30 years, sometimes it feels like 15 days. The flight was on its way to the offshore when Cougar's Sikorsky S-92 helicopter lost oil pressure from its main gearbox. The chopper ditched in the ocean 35 nautical miles off Newfoundland. 17 people were killed with one lone survivor. Less than two weeks ago, Cougar flights here were grounded again after the same model of chopper crashed in Norway's offshore, stirring up old, painful memories for family members like Breen. It just brings you right back to that, uh, that moment. It, it makes you uh, think of the families and think of what they're going through and, and think, you know, oh no, this can't, can't happen again. And Breen says it also puts a spotlight back on offshore safety. I think my concern is always that you can get complacent and you can't, uh, you can just let things just slip by and then it gets easier as time goes by. There's going to be a memorial service here at the Elam Pentecostal Tabernacle in St. John's starting at 7 o'clock tonight and at the same time there's going to be a moment of silence in the offshore. Reverend Christopher Fowler says the service will be live streamed and expects viewers from all over the world from the North Sea to the Gulf of Mexico and beyond. To the families, I think that's a real blessing uh, because they really appreciate and I guess they, they realize that uh, the, the support for them in this journey is uh, thousands of people that pause every year to remember and they take great comfort and strength in that. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, some students in Grand Falls, Windsor, say the College of the North Atlantic dropped the ball by not properly planning for Black History Month. The representative for international students at CNA says he reached out to campus administration multiple times looking for information about plans to mark the month. He says all of those messages went unanswered. Now the Canadian Federation of Students is calling out the university, saying black students feel unsupported and disregarded. It says celebrating Black History Month Month is key to helping students feel included and appreciated. So, an example. In Canada, there's a conversation around St. Patrick's Day. We acknowledge the, you know, the role of the Irish saints and, and the importance of that in the culture of Canada. And when people feel recognized, they say we feel like we're, we belong into something or we're part of something. When I talk about structural institutional racism is that the organization itself does not give room for us to feel like we're being celebrated. You know, the fact that people are not taking it seriously it feels like it's like, you know, it's not as important. It's just another one of those calendar events, you know, or perhaps even, uh, you know, the person's behavior, the lack of response and engagement from the institution also feels like it's, it's a form of discrimination that they're saying, well, we recognize a lot of events, but this is not an important one. Yet black people in the Atlantic province have played a significant role in the past. And at the moment, as international students, as you know, newcomers, we're playing a, a future role in the development of Canada. So being ignored and being taken, you know, not taken light, taken lightly, if you want to call it that, kind of sends a racist undertone. And, and yes, the, the institution will say, well, we didn't know, or I've heard the comment of, we were not aware and ignorance. And in today's day and age with cell phones, you can't say it, it's good enough for you to say, I wasn't aware. Well, the Canadian Federation of Students sent a letter expressing its disappointment on Friday and it says CNA has since organized events at its Stephenville and Grand Falls Windsor campuses. 
Well, Uber is putting out the call for drivers in this province, and the owner of Jiffy Cabs in St. John says his business is ready to compete. Chris Hollett says Jiffy's app offers a comparable service to the ride-hailing app and also says he's invested heavily in his fleet of nearly 100 cabs. That's about double the number of vehicles Jiffy had on the road last year. Now, Uber is offering a $200 incentive to drivers willing to join its fleet. Hollett says that's something he's seen across the country in an effort to disrupt the taxi industry. We've done our part to improve our service, and that's all we can do. Um, we are a local company. We just hope that people want to want to choose to ride with a local company versus, you know, sending money out of province to wherever, um, to wherever Uber is headquartered. I don't know. You know, so, so we just hope that people want to uh, just make the local choice. Well, speaking of cab drivers, we have a very colorful one to tell you about now. One who has scored himself a spot as a contestant on the new season of Canada's Got Talent. Harold Butler has racked up millions of views online, playing the spoons behind the wheel of his Bugden's taxi. Butler visited the St. John's Morning Show studio to share the news. The one and only Harold Butler, the viral spoon plane cab driver from St. John's. He has auditioned for the TV show Canada's Got Talent, and Harold is in the studio right now. Hi, Harold. Good morning. You couldn't help but play the spoons <laughs> along to that, could you? I can't. Every time I hear some good rhythm and stuff like that, I got a habit to take my spoons out and play it. Just tell us about the setup you got here. Okay. Every time I go anywhere, I can go and take a set of spoons. I bend them, and I either have elastic band around them, or I'll have... A hairband don't make a difference because I don't put my fingers in between them. Okay. Because if you play says if you know anybody knows plays as spoons, the longer you play them, the more blisters you get in the fingers. I had these welded. Oh really? They're welded. So now I'm gonna do. Okay. Oh, yeah. Did you ever imagine that playing the spoons would get you on the stage for Canada's Got Talent. No, I can't imagine myself getting myself on Facebook, which back then no one knew what Facebook was, and neither would I. But, I mean, to know where I'm at today because of the set of spoons. Do we know when your episode's coming on? I not exactly know what time or, or what part of the show that I'm going to be in or what when it's on, what week or what day, whatever. But I know that it's there. We got a little bit of uh, music queued up here for you. A new song from Pitbull. Dolly Pitbull Burn. and Dolly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to play it? I love that song. Do you? Yeah. You take it away. Turn up. Well, it was a tough day for cab drivers in Gander, that's for sure. And rain boots were definitely a must today, where it was a very messy day for drivers. Yeah, lots of rain on the roads, uh, lots of wet snow falling. That's since ended, but we do have another round on the way tomorrow for parts of the province. I will break it all down for you coming up.
For more than 60 years, two communities in Labrador West have hosted a winter carnival in March, and the annual event is now in full swing. Labrador City and Wabush come together to celebrate all the wonderful things winter has to offer in the big land. The Labrador West Winter Carnival kicked off on Friday and runs until this Saturday. Have a look. We are so excited. Um, we realized that uh, we've been doing Carnival since 1961. So this will be 63 years, I'm guessing, this year. And uh, we're pretty excited about realizing where we are, and we're getting very close to that 65 years even. So we've been planning since uh, early in the year, and we have an awful lot of events planned. It's going to be a wonderful time. <laughs> We really appreciate everything that all the organizations and groups put together to put in our booklet. And we have, oh my goodness, I believe over 80 events at least. The community's out in full bloom to, to give us those things. People really look forward to it and we've had people come in town from away and we've had people that have lived here and they look forward to coming back during that time because it's also a great time to ski and uh, we have a lot of people that enjoy to come back to do that. The excitement and the buzz of you know, the last, hopefully, hurrah of snow uh, before we hit uh, the spring is, is uh, very exciting. People look forward to getting out and participating. Here we are at Jill's Formal. We're having a great time. Right? For me, it's such an excitement to see everyone get out and enjoy being together and share a meal with each other. The kids come out. They're so excited for the events. So, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful time for us. Okay, Winter Carnival friends, it's the night you've been waiting for. It's our first ever official Kids Club Cookie Con. Over the years, we've watched the other communities in Newfoundland and how wonderful uh, they put off their events, and we've actually, uh, you know, used some of their ideas, and I'm so thankful for all the communities in Newfoundland that do all these kind of events, because it really does do a lot for your morale and your community. This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. The bonus prize deadline is midnight, Friday, April 12th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, Ashley, it certainly looks like they're having a blast up there in Labrador with that winter carnival. Some impressive slides there going down the hill as well. One shaped like a pirate ship. It was really interesting. It was very cool. Some nice weather too, uh, you know, as far as temperatures are concerned. In fact, uh, well above where you should be sitting for this time of year. Topping out at zero degrees in Lab City this morning. Really across the big land, temperatures are uh, above where you should be sitting. We're looking at temperatures across the island anywhere from four Four to six degrees, at least in the main areas, but uh, it really got warm this afternoon uh, for parts of the Avalon. Uh, Salmonier Nature Park recorded a temperature of 9.8 degrees this afternoon once we saw that sunshine come out. Uh, similar temperature in Bay Roberts, the Goulds, 8.2%, uh, I mean 2%, 8.2 degrees uh, Celsius, and uh, at the airport recorded 4.9 degrees. So certainly uh, helping with the snow, at least to get rid of it. Uh, but we do have those temperatures drop now back down to three degrees. A little bit of a wind chill out there as well. A very windy night last night, uh, anywhere from 80 to as much as 100 kilometer per hour winds. But those winds have since eased that wind chill only at about zero degrees at the moment. Minus five is what it feels like in Corner Brook. And the coolest uh, wind chill is up in Nain at about minus 11 at the moment. So if we take a look at the satellite and radar, we've the radar picture just had gone out there, but you can see uh, much less areas uh, are many less areas, I should say, are seeing some snowfall. Uh, but this is generally where we're going to see it continue through the night. The Green Bay, White Bay area and then up along northern peninsula east, so, which is why that snowfall warning is still in place and uh, back towards the Bay of Exploits as well. You're under that snowfall warning, uh, expecting this to continue as we head into tomorrow. And then we've got that freezing drizzle advisory from Hopedale through to Makovic. And you're also looking at freezing drizzle tonight and then into tomorrow afternoon uh, as well. Thanks to this onshore flow from this area of low pressure that is in no hurry 
to get out of here, but uh, we are seeing some uh, pulses of moisture move in. So let's take a look at the future tracker. Like I said, tonight we'll uh, see the snow generally uh, end for most, except along the northern peninsula east in Green Bay, White Bay. You're still going to continue to see that heavy snow, uh, and by heavy I mean wet snow, uh, through the overnight. Some uh, onshore flurry activity mixed with some freezing drizzle potentially on the west coast. And as we get into tomorrow morning, that second uh, little push of moisture is going to move in, and that means we'll start the day with uh, some wet snow all along the northeast coast. So our temperatures tonight are going to be hovering around the zero degree mark, maybe a degree above or degree below, uh, with generally much lighter winds than what we were seeing yesterday. Up across Labrador, you're looking at anywhere from zero to about minus five or minus six tonight and your winds will be out of the uh, northeast anywhere from 40 to as much as 50 kilometers per hour. So how much snow is still left to fall? We're still seeing that bullseye again in that area uh, of northern peninsula east in the Green Bay, White Bay area where we could still be talking uh, about those amounts nearing 15 to 25 centimeters of snow uh, by the time we get into tomorrow afternoon. Now, showing about 5 to 10 centimeters through the Gand area, back through Clarenville, it's going to be really wet, though, so it's going to have a hard time accumulating very much like what was happening uh, yesterday. And then even as you head towards uh, the Avalon, those numbers uh, will be a little less than that, so 2 centimeters, maybe 5 at the most. And you'll see those uh, that uh, flurry activity move through as we head through tomorrow afternoon and again through the overnight period where we'll likely see some showers uh, for the Avalon into, uh, like I said, the overnight. So as far as our temperatures are concerned tomorrow, they are going to be above zero anywhere from one to about four or five degrees tomorrow. Uh, Port of Basque looks like the hot spot tomorrow afternoon, about plus six will be your afternoon high. We'll see those winds shift from northwest to northeast, but they won't be overly impressive anywhere from 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. As you head towards the west coast, though, uh, the northeasterlies will be gusting around 50. And then for Labrador, uh, the potential for freezing drizzle will end as your temperatures come up above zero, uh, especially in Makovic. But uh, for the first half of the day, you can expect that. Otherwise, some sunshine in Happy Valley Goose Bay, plus four through tomorrow about plus one in Lab City with some cloudy periods. So the long range forecast is uh, a bit busy weather wise. We'll talk about that when I come back. Daily newspapers in Halifax, uh, Sydney, Cape Breton, St. John's, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island. You know, the, the, the daily newspapers may be picked up by somebody at a bargain rate and turned into ad uh, weeklies or whatever, I don't know. Saltwire files for creditor protection and says it has $94 million in debt. More on that story and what it might mean for newspapers after the break.
Base color. One seal buyer operates in the province, and that puts the hunt in a precarious situation. Watch part one of an appeal for seal, Sunday at 11.30 and Monday at 7. Well, as we reported last night, the company that owns nearly two dozen newspapers in Atlantic Canada, including the Telegram, is filing for creditor protection. Saltwire Network has debts of almost $100 million. It owns dailies and weeklies in three provinces. The CBC's Brett Ruskin has more on the situation and the potential fallout. It's the company that owns the most number of newspapers throughout Atlantic Canada, Saltwire Network, filing for creditor protection. Again, they own daily newspapers in the larger city centres, weeklies in the others, including the Chronicle Herald, which is one of the oldest independently owned newspapers in Canada, dating back to 1824 with its roots there. So around 500 employees work for the company, another 800 or so contractors work for the company, and they provide that news content for uh, the kind of the smaller areas all across different provinces across Atlantic Canada. Uh, so places where people get information about uh, the school board meetings, community events, things like that that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So a, a key conduit for local information is possibly at risk with again $94 million in debt due to be paid, about $33 million in assets according to court filings, some money due to the CRA, some money due to the pension fund uh, with unpaid payments to former employees for that pension fund, uh, as well as some money to private equity firms that helped them with an expansion back in 2017 when the company acquired up to 27 different newspapers from transcontinental media. Now, we heard from Stephen Kimber. He is a veteran journalist reporting in Atlantic Canada for more than 50 years. Well, unfortunately, I think it's much more the issue of bad management. I mean, you, you know, the first decision that you make to buy, uh, to create a, a network by buying all of these newspapers for a lot of money that you don't have. The company has put out a statement saying that this is a strategic move, one that will allow the company to continue moving forward to in, in, in a vibrant and resilient way to continue producing news and sharing news with Atlantic Canadians. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. And as you just heard, Stephen Kimber is a journalism professor at the University of King's College. And here's more about why he says this is bad news, not only for the survival of newspapers, but also for the media landscape as a whole. It's a disaster. I mean, you know, we've been facing this shrinking of newsrooms over the past couple of decades. So, so at some level, it's not new, but you know, you're taking out of the equation uh, daily newspapers in Halifax, uh, Sydney, Cape Breton, St. John's, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island. You know, the, the, the daily newspapers may be picked up by somebody at a bargain rate and turned into ad uh, weeklies or whatever. I don't know. The weeklies will mostly disappear. And, you know, that's where the news comes from in, in those cities and towns, school board meetings, city council meetings, that... Newspapers generally covered when nobody else did. So, you know, the, the, the old days, the Herald would cover uh, the school board when not, not much was happening, but that meant they were there when something did happen. And then the rest of us, the, the other media outlets in town would, would show up and suddenly would be able to cover that story. But if there's nobody there to do the initial coverage, uh, who's going to pick up and how is anybody going to know to pick up on important things that are happening? I mean, the newspapers were sort of the glue for 
the media landscape in terms of news over the years. That's lessened a lot. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the, the CBC's uh, websites, uh, provide a, a lot of, of news now that, you know, that, that, that is available in a way that it was not available before. And that's true also of CTV. But both of, both of those companies, those corporations are facing their own uh, cutbacks. So I think that, you know, uh, we're the, the the future for the newspaper industry itself is not good. Uh, the future for online news is probably much more promising, but it's a different kind of future. Advertising, which was the basis for uh, the success of newspapers over the generations, is gone. Right as a as a as an ad revenue source, classified ad, advertising is gone, and that means that. We have to depend on on readers to pay for this. 2017 is when the Herald was still in the middle of a strike, almost at the end, a very bitter strike that ended up resulting in the newsroom being cut in about half. But in the middle of that, the owners of the, the Chronicle Herald, the Herald uh, newspaper, uh, created a, a new company called Saltwire and bought 28 newspapers in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, including daily newspapers, weekly newspapers. And they did it with a huge debt. I mean, the $32 million that they didn't have uh, at a time when, if you looked at the industry, it was in big trouble. And then sort of it, it went from there. And, it, and, and the filings, the legal filings that, that showed up uh, in the last couple of days really show that, you know, Saltwire owes $93 million. It has the the debt that it took on to buy those papers uh, has not been paid back. There is therefore the $32 million plus interest on that. They haven't been paying uh, HST. Uh, they're behind on their taxes. The company pension plan is owed money. So, you know, it, it, it's very hard to see how they can uh, get out of this. It's a good collection. It's a good snapshot of what was going on during that time. 13 activists sharing their fight for disability rights during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s will meet some of the women making that documentary just ahead.
A group is embarking on a very particular kind of research project. They're collecting and sharing stories about how far this province has come in the fight for people with disabilities and their rights. They've even hired a local film company to help them document it all. Have a look. I'm with the History of Disability Rights, NL, which is an organization that's working to maintain and preserve the history of disability rights in the province of Newfoundland, Labrador. And today we're here to uh, celebrate and launch the trailer of a, a series of oral histories that we've done in videotaping. We did manage to get a few dollars to help us hire uh, Up Sky Down with Roger Monder. Roger took on the, the project to help us uh, videotape uh, 13 different activists. Joanne and I wanted to capture the stories of people who were really active during the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, so some time ago, in the area of disability rights. And we wanted to get their stories while they're still with us, before they go. Sometimes memories fade, uh, and sometimes history gets uh, reworded. Now we have their stories. If we don't remember our history of gaining disability rights, we lose them, I think. Because we have so many different disability areas that we're focused on, it's a good collection, it's a good snapshot of what was going on during that time. A reminder of where we've been, so we don't repeat it, that we don't slip back there. A reminder of the services that people fought for, that people got to be able to live in a community, to take part in their community, give back to their community, be married, have families, have jobs. They'll hear individual stories of people who may be someone who has mental illness. What that individual went through in terms of trying to get treatment, their experiences in employment, maybe somebody who has uh, lost some hearing and the difficulty that they had finding employment. But what it does do is show where we were and it'll also show where we are now. And there's a big difference. PEI's top doctor says it's only a matter of when, not if, measles return to that island. With cases popping up across North America and March break just around the corner, health officials expect to see some cases soon. I think it's really important for people to know how effective two doses of measles containing vaccine are. So if two doses, with two doses, it's 97% effective. And even with one dose, they think it may be 93% effective. Um, so in general, most people in Prince Edward Island have been vaccinated um, to, against measles, um, but it's really important if you've not been vaccinated or certainly not fully vaccinated and up to date, uh, it's a time to make sure that uh, you reach out and get vaccinated. Morrison says because of that high vaccination rate, she thinks it's unlikely Prince Edward Island will experience a measles outbreak. Well, now to some sports. Curlers from around the world are starting to arrive in Sydney, Nova Scotia for the Women's World Championships. The event at Centre 200 starts on Saturday and runs until March 24th. It's the first World Women's Curling Championship to take place in that province. You know, there's 13 teams coming from all over the planet as far as ways New Zealand and Turkey and but there's probably 10 teams that could be competing for a medal here. So that's that says a lot about the, the, the how the sport has grown and the quality of the competition. It's just not Canada anymore. There's, you know, there's many teams that could come in and, and win this. And uh, that, I think, is exciting. I know the fans would love to see Canada win. Well, she may not have won an Oscar on Sunday night, but actress Lily Gladstone made her mark. The Indigenous performer has been making history throughout this awards season. And as Magda Gabrasalasa tells us, she's been sharing the spotlight on the red carpet with Indigenous designers. Lily, can we have you on this way? Lily Gladstone's red carpet looks stunned and inspired, putting Indigenous designers on the same stage as some of the world's best known luxury brands. I am wearing Joe Big Mountain with uh, Gucci. The Killers of the Flower Moon Star has made award season history. The Sixagate Setapi and 
Namipu actor, is the first indigenous performer to win the Golden Globe for Best Actress in a Drama and the first to earn the SAG Award for an outstanding performance by a female actor in a leading role. Along the way, in magazines and on the red carpet, she's been wearing indigenous designs, bringing the bling in beaded jewelry and striking a pose in standout looks. Among those that made the cut to dress the star is Anishinaabe designer Leslie Hampton. Hampton, who is based in Toronto, designed this look worn by Gladstone in Variety magazine. So this is what we sent. And this dress as an option for the star to consider for the Oscars. It's so exciting to be able to have that connection with Lily um, and to celebrate her massive achievements and moments that are happening right now, not only for her, but for Indigenous people. And it's an exciting time for the many Indigenous designers tapping into new or traditional methods. You'll see that with like quill work and bead work and uh, ribbon skirts. Sage Paul says what's happening in fashion right now is monumental. To see Indigenous made garments and fashion and accessories on the red carpets, on the runways, even Indigenous models, it's inspiring. Uh, we can see younger generations be seeing themselves represented in those spaces. They too could one day make their own mark on future award seasons to come. Magda Gebra Celeste, CBC News, Toronto. Four long-term crew members of the International Space Station are safely back home. They've been in orbit for about six and a half months. What a beautiful sight. As you can see on your screen, we have Dragon flash down. Their SpaceX Dragon capsule dropped into the Gulf of Mexico off Pensacola, Florida, a little before dawn. The four crew members aboard are from the U.S., Denmark, Japan, and Russia. It's the seventh successful round trip for SpaceX.
My name is Charlie White. I have an outdoor YouTube channel based out of Cold Brook, Newfoundland, right next to Stephenville in the Bay St. George area. Chase the Seasons is something that we do every single year. As Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, it's getting out and doing whatever activity is available for us at that time. So what we're gonna be doing together here over the next couple months is we're gonna be doing some rabbit snaring. We're gonna be doing some ice fishing for trout and smelt. And we're gonna be doing some snowmobiling, some winter camping. It all depends on what mother nature is gonna throw at us. Well, it may still be winter, but it felt almost spring-like out there today in uh, St. John's with that sunshine. I couldn't get over how warm it felt. I know. It feels so nice. Yeah, that, uh, you know, sun angle is getting a bit higher, which is yeah. nice. So we certainly feel that sun a lot more. Uh, not the case, though, through portions of central and uh, the west coast as well today. But uh, if we take a look at the temperatures for tomorrow, we are going to be again above zero. Not nearly as warm as today. Anywhere from one to six degrees uh, down on the southwest coast, you're definitely going to see some nice temperatures, uh, but still looking at that unsettled uh, weather with the chance of some very wet snow along with some showers up across Labrador. You're looking at temperatures between one and four degrees through the day, except to the north where you will sit around minus four through your afternoon. So this area of low pressure is going to stick with us for a little while longer. So we're still going to see uh, that onshore flow continue as we head into Thursday morning. The potential for flurries will stick around and we've still got some unsettled conditions up across Labrador as well. So most of us will be seeing generally cloudy skies uh, through the afternoon hours on Thursday. And again, that potential for a few flurries in the mix. Then we see it's a better chance of some light snow uh, moving in for Lab West late Thursday and uh, continuing through the night. So our temperatures are going to be hovering around one to about four degrees across the island. Similar temperatures though up across Labrador, except towards the coast where your temperatures will sit below zero through the day on Thursday, anywhere from about minus one to minus five. So as we head into Thursday evening and then eventually into Friday morning, we're looking at that slow uh, movement of that snow moving east as we get into the morning hours. Otherwise another quiet start across the island uh, where we see clouds and then maybe some flurries as we head into the afternoon. But for the most part, uh, not too much in the way of weather, but we're still looking at those unsettled conditions. Now, nothing significant in the weather, but our daytime highs will drop a little bit for the eastern half of the island where you'll be hovering around minus one through the day. As you head towards central and the west coast of the island, typically uh, generally around plus one, maybe a little bit below there. And then for St. Anthony, you'll be hovering around plus one through the day. Now up across Labrador, uh, over uh, towards the southeast, your temperatures will be sitting somewhere between zero and about plus one, two degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab City to Nain. You'll be hovering around uh, minus one, uh, minus two or minus five through the day. So the long range forecast, again, unsettled. Nothing super significant, uh, but it is still going to be gray and we're still looking at the chance of some showers or flurries in the forecast as temperatures hover within a degree or two of zero and really not moving too much overnight either as our daytime high or day, overnight lows rather between minus one and minus three. For central Newfoundland, you're looking at a fairly decent weekend. You'll see some sunshine and temperatures uh, anywhere from one to about three degrees through the day. And then for western Newfoundland, same thing. A little bit more cloud cover, maybe the chance of a few flurries on Saturday. And, you're, and we'll be sitting around uh, three or two degrees. Now for eastern Labrador, we're looking at temperatures, uh, you know, between two and three degrees through the afternoon, generally with a mix of sun and cloud right across the board. So really no measurable snow in the forecast. And then for Western Labrador, uh, you're looking at some snow. You may pick up a couple of centimeters here and there uh, as we head through Sunday, but uh, overall temperatures above seasonal where you sit anywhere from about minus one to minus three through the day. Our weather photo of the day is a great shot of uh, Peely's Island. I believe I had a photo of, uh, from Peely's Island uh, earlier this week too, or maybe it was last week, can't remember. They're all 
becoming one. <laughs> but uh, Pansy shared this lovely shot. This was before the snow. Uh, I believe this was on Monday, but uh, great shot there. Thank you for that blue sky. If you oh. have any weather photos that you would like to share with us, you can send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Gotta love the colorful houses too. It's a great, great shot. Looks like a nice crisp day for sure. And it looks like Eastern Labrador has kind of won the weather lottery for this week. It looks like it's going to be super nice there. Absolutely. I know there has been a lack of snow, though, and everybody's upset about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you can get out and enjoy the sunshine. We've got yeah. the uh, spring is just around the corner, at least on the calendar anyway. But uh, we'll see what the weather shows up, yep. if it shows up. <laughs> We're getting through it. We're almost there, almost at the finish line for spring. We certainly are. All right. Well, that's it for us. And as we leave you tonight, let's have a look uh, outdoors actually and see how it's looking uh, in St. John's. A little bit of cloud cover there, but overall a really, really nice day. I'm loving it. Still bright outside too, Ash. I love that. 7, yeah. 7 p.m. sunsets, bring them on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you have a great night. Good night.